Today I get the most thrilling, exciting task and the most complex and difficult. I get to answer the question, who is God? I've got the best job in the world today and the hardest job in the world at the same time. What a marvelous question, who is God? What an eternal question, what an unending, what an expansive question, who is God? Today we're continuing our series on essentials, four questions that you can't ignore. And the first question we did last week is, what is the Bible? If you missed it, you can catch up on our YouTube channel or our church app. What is the Bible? And today, question number two, four questions you can't ignore, who is God? Next week will be, what is the gospel? And then the last question to tie it all together is, who am I in light of all of those truths? So today we're going into this question of who is God, and I like A.W. Tozer's famous quote. He says, the most important thing about you, the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about God. Just let that sink in. And I believe that that's true because our view of God and how we answer that question, who is God, has implications for today and our life now, and it has implications for our future as well, for our eternal future. Who is God? You know, people have tried to answer that question in many ways. Some people say God is like an energy like electricity that is flowing through the pews and the chairs and the trees and us, and it's really doesn't have a personality, it's not a being, it's just like electricity, it's just a life force. That would be more of a pantheistic worldview. Some people have said, who is God? And they've tried to answer that question by saying, well, God is just a set of truths or ideas, like Buddhism. You ever seen the different types of Buddhas? In fact, true Buddhism is a worshiping of the truths that each different Buddha idol represents. The different postures of Buddha each represent a different truth, a different value. And what's worshiped isn't Buddha himself or the idol, it's the truth or the ideal. Some people have said God isn't as much an ideal or a life force. It is a person, it's a being, but he's removed and he's aloof. He came over here and stirred the pot and set something into motion, but then ran away and is off doing other God things somewhere else in the corner of the universe. He can't be known personally. That would be deism. Or some people say, who is God? This guy. I am God. That would be the atheistic view that there really is no God and therefore I am him. And I get to make all the rules for my life, and I get to make any definition that I want to, right or wrong, and that's how it has led us into our culture where vice has become virtue. Up has become down, and down has become up. When we look to the Bible, is how we begin to answer this question the right way. Imagine there was a diving board. The end of the diving board that I jump off of dramatically determines my outcome, doesn't it? If I jump off of a high dive board and I'm springing off the wrong starting point, well, the result is going to be catastrophic for me. I need to jump off the right side, the correct starting point in order to end up land safely in the water. You know where those ideologies and those philosophies that I've just referenced, you know where they erred, you know where they misstepped, you know, they had the incorrect launching point off the diving board. The launching point was, what do I believe God is? What do I think God is? But you see, by definition, the divine cannot be defined by me. It can't be fashioned by my own hands. It can't be crafted or architected and written. No, it is other. It is in itself. Anything we know to answer this question of who is God is given to us. It is intended to be learned and then followed. 
So the incorrect starting point is asking the question, what do I think about God? In our individualistic culture, it's a very natural question that if it goes unchallenged, gets us to the wrong starting point. You know what the correct starting point is to end up in the blue water? Not what do I think about God or who do I think God is. It is who does God say he is? That's the correct starting point. And we know from last week's sermon, the most specific and condensed self-revelation of God, where he tells us who he is, is right here in the Word of God. And then, of course, Jesus Christ became, this is the written Word of God, and then Jesus Christ became the Word made flesh who lived among us. Also, the climax of God's self-revelation about who he is. He's the one, the only one that can answer that question for us, who is God? It's our role to believe and have faith in what he has defined. So that's the correct launching point. There's a guy in the Bible who asked that same question, who is God? His name is Moses. This is one of the first times we start to see God's name. And chronologically where we pick up in the story, Moses has already escaped from Egypt. He's out pasturing a flock, and this is the moment where he sees the burning bush. And he says, what is this peculiar event? The bush is on fire, but it's not being consumed. I got to go check this out. My Instagram followers are going to love this. I'm going to get at least 10,000 likes off this one. So he creeps up on it, and he has this encounter with God. God says, take off your shoes you're standing on holy ground, and he gives them an assignment. You're going to go and be my mouthpiece to save the nation of Israel from slavery. And Moses is like, oh, I'm on, oh wait, wait, wait. Uh, I better check one more thing. I'm imagining when I go, they're going to they're gonna ask me, who sent you? What should I tell them? In other words, who is God? Who are you? And this is God's response. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel, and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. I am. You know, in biblical Hebrew, languages progress over time. So there's modern Hebrew, and then there's biblical Hebrew. And in biblical Hebrew, there, there was really not differences of like past, present, and future tenses. You'd pick up the tense through the context of what was being said. And in this, you could, you could almost interpret that original text as God saying, I was who I was. I am who I am, and I will be who I will be. In other words, I'm outside of time. I am eternal. God is saying that he is present. He is not dependent on anyone else to exist. Nobody fashioned him. He is eternal forever. This is the person who we say is God. This is how he has revealed himself to us. He's revealed himself to us as three in one, as an all-powerful, all-knowing, loving father and creator of all. He revealed himself through Adam the nation, to the nation of Israel and ultimately revealed himself to all creation through the person of Jesus Christ. My words fall short today, but I'm trying to describe to you the most amazing being that you will ever meet or encounter he is the first and the last. He's a creative force unlike anything else. You can't understand his generosity and love, his faithfulness, because he perfectly balances justice and grace at the same time. He shares then his authority with us and has commissioned us to be creative stewards of this magnificent creation that he has made. And despite his power, his omniscience, his all-knowing Ex never-ending self-sufficiency, he does not remain distant. And he knows you. And he knows and cares about every little detail of your life. And he calls you child. This magnificent being that I just described calls you child. 
And that's really where I want to land today. My big idea, if you could take one thing home, rattling around in your mind and your spirit and your gut today, would be this, that God, who is he? He's a father. He's a father. He's a perfect father. All of our dads have failed us in some way. There's no perfect earthly father. Although I got a pretty darn good one. When I say the word father, that might hit you differently, everybody emotionally. And that's not really the point today. Because even though our earthly fathers may fail us in some way, God stands as the perfect heavenly father. Who is God? He's a father. Of course, father is the first person of the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this father is the, described to us in the scriptures as the father first and foremost like of all creation, of all humanity. Listen to this verse, Acts 17, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being God's offspring, then we should think that divine nature is not like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art or imagination. So God is the, the source of life for creation and for humanity. As the poet says, in the vapor of his breath, the planets form. So first, follow with me down this funnel. He's the father of all humanity. He's the, the first person of the Trinity. He's the father of all humanity. But then a little more specifically, if you follow the red thread through scriptures, he then is the father of the nation of Israel. He miraculously inserts himself into Abraham and Sarah's life. And even though the scriptures tell us they were too old to have children, they were past the childbearing age, he miraculously gives them a son, Isaac, through which he founded the nation of Israel. Tears of joy will stream down their faces, and I will lead them home with great care. This is Jeremiah 31. They will walk beside quiet streams and not stumble, for I am Israel's father, and Ephraim is my oldest child. God's portrayal of a father is a bit more rare in the Old Testament, although it's there. Obviously, I just read you some of those scriptures where he is described as father. Jeremiah, Isaiah 64 also says, yet you, Lord, are father. We are the clay. You are the potter. We are a work of your hands. So the portrayal of God as father is in the Old Testament, but it really heats up in the New Testament. When God, follow this funnel, father of all creation, father of the nation of Israel, he's the father of Jesus Christ, the unique father of Christ. In the book of John, Jesus calls God father over a hundred times, categorically as to be Jesus' favorite way to address the father. And not just that, that's how he taught us to address God. In the Lord's Prayer, we pray it every week. And it wasn't like this is a way to address God. This is what Jesus was saying. This is the way to address God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You hear the joke about the, little, the mom that asked her son, do you know God's name? The little boy said, I sure do. She was surprised by his confidence, and she said, wow, what is his name? And he says, hallowed. She says, wow, how do you know that? We say it every week, Mom. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> our Father, our Father, our Father. That's how Jesus taught us to address him. And we see that there's this relationship between the Father and the Son, but it shouldn't be thought of in earthly terms like Father and Son. It's not like Jesus has a cosmic mother back in the ages of the universe. No, the Trinity, they're all co-equal, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They're a community of creativity. And so just because the Word took on flesh, 
he relinquished some of that power in order to take the humble form of a man. The father-son dynamic is given to us so that we can kind of understand the interplay between the two. What happened in Matthew when Jesus got baptized? A voice from heaven said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So the father acknowledges the son, but then the son acknowledges the father. Then he says, my father has given me everything. He's the only one who, who knows the son, and the only one who truly knows the father is the son. But the son wants to tell others about the father. In other words, Jesus is saying, I'm a pretty bad dude. I got it all together, and I'm pretty cool in and of itself, but everything I have, guess what? It was given to me by him. And then the father goes, this is my son. I am well pleased with him. Do what he says. And they're constantly going, no, look at my father. He's incredible. Look at my son. Look at my boy. I'm so proud of him. There's this interconnectivity between father, son, and Holy Spirit. The Bible makes it clear that Jesus was teaching us to think of God as father. Who is God? Father. And then, track me down this funnel it gets to us. Yes, God's the father of all humanity. He's the father of the nation of Israel. He's the father of the son, Jesus. And guess what? He is your father, if you so choose, the bridge that the son has built. Listen to what Paul says in Romans. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about by your adoption into sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, which it says, Dad, Daddy, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Has it set deep into your spirit that you are a child of God? Is it deep-rooted in your identity that that's who you are? Because I'm telling you, if you're lacking confidence, if you're attacked by fear or anxiety, or if you're swept up in the approval of others, or any temptations of the flesh, it's always rooted when we forget that we have sonship and daughtership in the Almighty God. We're starting to ascribe to other little g gods as opposed to God our Father. Because when you know that you are a son and a daughter, you are adopted into his family, you are in his hand. And there's nothing that can pluck me out of it. No war, no sickness, no conflict, no life circumstance that can be thrown at me. I can trust in the goodness of God. And you know why this is so important? It's different to think of, oh, I believe in God, you know, the Father of creation. That is an impersonal approach to God where he wants to get you, and this is my landing, is an intimate father-son, father-daughter relationship with him. And that's my heart for you as, as your pastor as well. I want you to have an intimate father-daddy relationship with him. That's how Jesus addressed him. And Jesus, in his moment of greatest need, in the Garden of Gethsemane, with the, facing the cross, how did, he, how did he address God in Mark 14? Abba, Father, Daddy, Dad. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. However, not my will, but your will be done. I don't want you to just know God as the Father of the nation of Israel, as the Father of, of creation or as the father of just Jesus Christ, the son, I want you to know him as your dad, your perfect divine dad. Guess what? Who hears you, who speaks to you, who loves you, who provides for you. Luke 12, we read it earlier. What, can you add an hour to your life by being afraid? Look at the birds of the air. Our Father provides for them, and He will provide for you. So I challenge you when you ask to answer that question, who is God? I would love for your first words out of your mouth to be, He's my Father. He's my Father. And through Jesus Christ, I have been adopted into His family, and I get full family benefits that come with that. I'm going to close with this quote from J.I. Packer. What were we made for? To know God. What aim should we have in life? 
To know God. What is the eternal life Jesus gives? To know God. What is the best thing in life? To know God.